So in Fasa Gaia, Facing Gaia, the French revised and extended version of his Gifford Lectures, uh, published in October 2015, Bruno Latour argues that we need a new kind of mapping to tackle the challenge that global warming raises regarding our ways to think of, live on, and rely to the Earth. The mapping in question has nothing to do with modern maps based on nation states' ownerships on land and on the right for nation states to appropriate and colonize territories that do not function according to the laws of Western imperialism. This new kind of mapping would exit the categories of nature and humanity, would encompass new territories recently discovered, it would radically redistribute what belongs to sciences, politics, or religion. It would, in short, revisit how our cosmology is assembled. Such a dynamic experimental mapping is aimed at flourishing new possibilities for thinking with a nurse way more complex that, than what the image of the globe makes us guess. In that sense, this new mapping resonates with what Deleuze and Grattery describe in the introduction to A Thousand Plateaus. The map, so I quote, the map does not reproduce an unconscious closed in upon itself, it constructs the unconscious. It fosters connections between fields, the removal of blockages on bodies without organs, the maximum opening of bodies without organs onto a plane of consistency. It is itself a part of the rhizome. The map is open and connectable in all of its dim dimensions. It is detachable, reversible, susceptible to constant modification. It can be torn, reversed, adapted to any kind of mounting, reworked by an individual, group, or social formation. It can be drawn on a wall, conceived of, of as a work of art, constructed as a political action, or as a mediation." End quote. Mapping, Deleuze and Guattari argue, is and can be a rhizomatic, anti-imperialist tool. Mapping has a performative power to connect follow and multiply the lines of flight that run along the body without organs that is the earth in a thousand plateaus. In the book, bodies and even the whole plane of nature are nothing but intensive latitude and extensive longitude. The theme of the map as the drawing of intensities and forces is no unique to a thousand plateau. In Deleuze Foucault, a diagram is defined as and I quote, a map of relations between forces, a map of destiny or intensity, which proceeds by primary non-localizable relations and at, the, at every moment passes through every point, end quote. Both in a thousand plateau and in Foucault, <coughs> those maps are sub-representative and are not the products of thought but rather the conditions for thinking and experimenting. In that sense, I would like to argue they perform as a dark precursor, a dark precursor whose characteristics of preceding specification into art, philosophy, or other creative fields is particularly welcome to reshape our maps of the Earth in the era of the Anthropocene. In order to better understand this singular kind of mapping, and what it can teach us in the frame of this conference, I suggest we turn to the inspiration of Deleuze and Guattari for conceptualizing their mapping. I'm thinking of Fernand Deligny and the maps he drew of autistic children's journeys. Deligny is clearly credited as a major influence in Deleuze's thought, both in A Thousand Plateaus and in the dialogues with Claire Parnet. Relatively famous in the French milieus of art, alternative psychiatry, and of course, the Lusian philosophy, the Lini's name remains quite unknown in English-speaking parts of academia, although a first translation of some of his texts has recently been published. Fernand Deligny could be described as a French educator, but only if educating does not mean normalizing directing someone to a classical, standard mode of life. If the Lini was an educator, it was in order to live with and learn from people on the margins, 
not to extract them from the margins which were the world. In 1948, he created La Grande Cordée, an association experimenting with alternative modes of caring for and curing unstable teenagers. When La Grande Cordée encountered too many difficulties in 1965, he was invited by Jean Horry and Félix Watari to the Laborde Clinic, an important place of experimentation in French anti-psychiatry. <coughs> he left Laborde in 1967 to establish himself and his team in the Seven, in the center of France. He lived there until his death. Deligny was not alone in the Seven. He was there with some colleagues defined as close presences for the children. They quickly created a network for welcoming autistic children for a short stay or even for life as in, as in the case of Jean-Marie, an autistic person who would become a major character of Deligny's work. Deligny even summarizes his life commitment as living in the close presence of Jean-Marie. In the Seven, Deligny would, lear would learn to approach the world of autistic persons just as the autistic children would try to fit into the network's world. The idea of mapping autistic children's journeys arose in the Seven. In 1969, Jacqueline, one of the close presences to the children, spoke to Deligny about his anxiety when he saw children biting themselves or banging their foreheads against stones. Deligny suggested that, rather than name one child or another, Lynn think in terms of special experience that he set down what he sees on a piece of paper rather than speaking about symptoms that do not fit what the children feel. This maybe a gendery scene gives us the motto of Deligny's maps. Do not say the symptoms, but keep traces of what happens in your territory. Thus, people working in Deligny's network began to draw maps of the journeys performed by the autistic person with whom they lived. Typically, they proceed as follows. At first, they trace a basic map of the living space organized around points of reference from everyday life, bed, kitchen, well, woodshed, and so forth. Secondly, they put a tracing sheet on the map. It is used to describe the movements performed in the territory in the course of a day. On this tracing sheet, some lines are traces of the close presence's movements. They are generally straight and show a practical interest, for instance, cooking. Other lines, curved, repetitive, going nowhere precisely, are traces of the children's journeys and are often drawn with Indian ink. The Lini calls this non-utilitarian lines, lignes d'air, wonder lines. It's uh, difficult to translate correctly into English, but the most common translations are wonder lines or lines of drift in a thousand plateaus. And so these lignes d'air are a concept that will catch Deleuze and Guattari's attention. No, lines of flight is really the Deleuze and Guattari concept, which is inspired by the lignes d'air, but it's not exactly the same. Wonder lines generally occupy a large part of the tracing sheet. They are accompanied by different graphic signs, such as, amongst many others, a dark floor or a small spider-like shape that designates a swaying movement, some Y shape that indicates spots where the lines belonging to the close presences and the children wonder lines meet to open a common space. The lines can also be adorned with a fuller tracing indicating the exaggeration proper to some children's gesture an exaggeration that close presences can imitate in order to have their own gestures noticed by the children. Once several tracing sheets are completed, they can be superimposed on the map in a multitude of possible combinations. These combinations allow us to see patterns or limits in the wonder lines. 
They may also afford an aesthetic experience, but their purpose is certainly not to explain something that could, that could be recorded into verbal, clinical language. The Nini's maps are not representations, they are tracks and traces. Tracing does not allow any kind of self-reflexive representation. Tracing only evokes. Tracing on the lines on paper is a way to approach the tracks whereby children draw a singular territory in a symbiosis with human and non-human elements. The cartographical tracings are then themselves a collaboration between the network and the children. And, as Erin Manning says, and I quote, they become incipient cartographies of an associated milieu that builds on the way movement and life living interrelate, unquote. The maps thus open a new space and a new time to the close presences who draw them. Cartographic gestures are considered as the, as the reenactment of the mode of being performed by the children. Now, I would like to focus on what this singular way of mapping can bring to the debate about the reshaping of our modes of thought and representation. First of all, as Erin Manning argues in, in her book Always More Than One, and she talked a little bit about it yesterday, the kind of sensitivity to an autistic experience of milieus that those map low to approach has everything to do with creativity, and especially with the pre-individual, pre-verbal, and pre-conceptual field in which creativity develops. Manning coins the term enthusiasm to describe such a creative field, and I quote, Enthusiasm is a name I am giving to the tremulous field of expression itself, to its exuberance, especially when this field percolates at the very limits of expressibility in the before of subject or object, in the before of image or form. Enthusiasm as a movement with that colors expressibility, given, giving a certain allure to the coming to expression. I is not enthusiastic. The shape of worlding is enthusiastic informing toward an act without predecessor, an act always yet in the trembling." End quote. For Manning, the autistic experience, as it is described by Delini, is, uh, is a privileged way to approach life in the making and world in the shaping before the separation of human actor and object receptor. The performance and the very agency of the autistic lie there in the shaping of enthusiasm in the opening of possible worlds held in the pre-individual affective field of experience. The thought that the Linnis map perform is thus pre-subjective, although essential for grasping the co-construction of a milieu and its subjects. For the autistic, to be in the world is to world, to experience the unfolding in all of its complexity of the coming of all drops of experience, says Manning. This pre-personal and pre-subjective field of experience also plays a decisive part in the political aspect of Delaney's work. The maps allow Delaney to advance a notion of the unconscious as a political experiment of what is common. In the 70s, when Delaney began to think about the common, le commun, literally meaning what is common, but as a substantive. He found that all ideologies seem to be structured by this notion, from the Christian communion to communism with community experiences in between. He asked for a re-evaluation of what the experience of a world, not primarily organized by linguistic and symbolic categories, might bring to the debate. The common, then, must be what persists to precede anything in an unconscious way. Those are the words of the Lini. In other words, if the common precedes the conscious symbolization of what a person is and means, then the common is the state in which we are deprived of the grammatical persons. 
In the common, there is neither I, me, my, nor he, she, him, her, nor is there the opposition of one and the other. The common is what we find when tracing one lines and has nothing to do with persons. If there is a common body, it can only be the one that is drawn in the maps. Deleuze and Guattari acknowledge as much in A Thousand Plateaus, and I quote, Deligny invokes a common body upon which these lines are inscribed as so many segments, thresholds, or quanta, territorialities, deterritorialization, or re-territorializations. End quote. And so they establish in the next sentence a clear link between this common body and their own concept of body without organs. This body is for Deligny a primordial we, and is radically political insofar as it calls for a revision of the extent of thought and also of subjectivity. How do we think and make, make exist what we are in common without referring to already individualized persons and entities? The milieu drawn by the Linis maps is made of what a thousand plateaus would call non-personal affects. Thus, it redefines subjectivity and, more precisely, the way subjectivity is constituted. In essays, critical and clinical, Deleuze argues that the cartographic, the cartographic paradigm suggested by Deligny could be an alternative to the Freudian psychoanalytic one, which is archaeological. For Freud, the work of a psychoanalyst is similar to that of an archaeologist, discovering interpreting and translating the meaning of ruins, of pieces of stone that lie on the earth and are clues to reconstructing, reconstructing old buildings that have disappeared. While the archaeological paradigm takes a vertical direction, the clues lead, lead us to what is hidden deep under, the cartographic one is horizontal. We are and we express ourselves through what we do and how we play in space, immanently. <coughs> a cartographic construction of subjectivity should also help us conceive that subjectivity is not primarily a matter of persons, but of milieu. Following Deligny's suggestions, Deleuze writes, and I quote, the trajectory matches not only with the subjectivity of those who travel through a milieu, but also with the subjectivity of the milieu itself, insofar as it is reflected in those who travel through it. The map expresses the identity of the journey and what one journey is through. It merges with its object when the object itself is movement. Nothing is more instructive than the path of autistic children such as those whose maps the Ligny has revealed and superimposed with their customary lines, wandering lines, loops, corrections, and turnings back, all their singularities." End quote. What we are facing here is a cartographic paradigm that describes subjectivity as an arrangement inclusive of both humans and non-humans. As Felix Quattari would have said, this cartographic paradigm decenters the question of, subject, of the subject onto the question of subjectivity. Hence, it takes into account everything that defines a subject performatively, its milieu, its moves, its rituals, its gestures, instead of seeing it as a pre-existent entity that bestows sense on its whole world. Please. Yeah, as a conclusion, because of their self-representative activation of virtual possibilities, because of the performativity at stake in the shaping of the common body and of subjective territories, I suggest that the Linus maps act as dark precursor for creative process, whether they specify into artistic, conceptual, or political propositions. For the same reasons, the Linus maps could be of great help for mapping new human and non-human connection to the earth in the process Latour advocates for after centuries of modern capitalist and imperialist mapping. Maps must become existential circumscriptions following Guattari's word, and Guattari also said that just a map 
must require no less than a biological, sensitive, perceptual semiotics, thought functioning without images, uh, with images, categories, gestures, verbalizations, political and social fields, formalized writings, art, music, we friends. So all that are characterization, characterization of what a map must be for Guattari. As we learn with the Linnis work, maps are vectors of multiplication that are not we absorbed into a standardized unity. They promote an intensification of common experience. Those new maps, I argue, are some new means of philosophical expression, such as the ones Deleuze invokes in the, pref in the preface to difference and repetition, means that lead philosophers to write, and I quote Deleuze too, and this paper, to write at the frontiers of our knowledge, at the border which separates our knowledge from our ignorance and transforms the one into the other. Thank you. That's a good question, and um, I don't know if it has directly influenced nomadic thinking. Uh, what seems clear is that uh, it was firstly Guattari uh, who knew the Ligny as they both worked in anti-psychiatry and so on. Um, so, as the nomadic thinking appears in works with uh, Guattari, it, I think it's not really a coincidence, it's coherent, uh, but it appears in different parts of the book, so I couldn't say formally, uh, I'm sure uh, it's directly connected, but yeah, it appears around the same years, uh, for the same reasons, so but yeah, I think a it's... Symptom, perhaps. Sorry? Kind of like a symptom, perhaps, the way it appears, and it's not so easily traceable. Yeah, uh, well, I would say uh, I don't know if it's connected uh, when Deleuze and Guattari were, uh, write the book, but it's definitely connected. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, what, um, you, you've talked about the, the value of these uh, maps I have from a Deleuze perspective. What value do they have for the community? In particular, what value do they have for the people who are working with the children? Oh, it was a really, really important uh, tool for them. Well, for people working with the children, it was really a, a good tool. Actually, there is a, a book with 200 maps uh, drawn by different people uh, from the Linux network. And you can really see styles of different people drawing the maps and that they keep using them for more than decades. Uh, so for this part, yes, it was really a useful tool in the, in the team. It was really a way to approach the children without all the psychiatric uh, symptoms and so on. And for the Lini, the Lini wrote a lot. Uh, his completed work is like 2,000 pages and he, he, he wrote a lot about how to escape language with images and maps. So for him too, it was like a, a life quest, if you want. The, the, the maps were uh, an important part of this life quest. You said they were using them and they were a means of escaping language. What, what kind of forms of activity or, or conduct did they lead to? No, um, I mean for the, for the close presences to the, the children, it was a way to live with the children without always referring to verbal categorization of what is happening. Uh, it was not intended to 
uh, lead to some activities and not others. It was really um, more a way of feeling, if you want. I don't, I'd be interested to hear the details. Yeah. 